Most people would think that Lockheed Martin is a predominantly white male company, but in reality, our commitment to bringing diverse candidates into the workforce is really a key pillar to our leadership team, as well as not even diversity of candidates, but diversity of thought. And that really helps drive our innovative solutions to our customers. I like to create an environment where people feel that they can bring the best thing about themselves to work. And that's actually part of the reason I really love our team, because it allows us to not be restricted by traditional organizational structures. You get to be a part of projects that no one else is working on. You get to have a inside look at technologies that very few companies and industries are really developing. My work directly impacts the military community and their ability to be effective soldiers in war. The technologies that we give them will be able to complete their missions in the effectiveness that they need and that they can be brought home back to their country, back to their family. I feel a sense of impact because I know exactly how our products can be applied and it's not the same thing as someone's going to walk around with a Lockheed Martin product in their hand, but we're creating technologies that have never been seen by anyone today. So even if you are worried that what you're impacting today, maybe you don't see someone using it tomorrow, just realize that you are literally making an impact that will change the course of technology for life. Well, welcome back to our program a tribute to service, community, country, and humanity. A few minutes break is always good, but now it's time to start our next session. But before we do that, first, we greatly appreciate the Tuskegee Airmen discussion and Dr. Joyce Braggins. What a tremendous panel, and thank you to all of them for their participation. We will focus on service during this next panel discussion entitled Girls Can Fly with three accomplished women from aerospace and aviation. These female trailblazers are wonderful and have much we can all learn from. And I'm especially interested in hearing from Marion being a former Marshall Space Flight Center employee myself. But before we go on, I've just been told there's someone else who wants to join in our program right now. So zooming in from 400 kilometers or about 248 miles above Earth from onboard the International Space Station, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome NASA astronaut Victor Glover. Hello everyone, it's Victor Glover here, checking in during my six-month mission aboard the International Space Station. I'm excited to be joining you on this national holiday as we celebrate Martin Luther King. One of Dr. King's famous quotes is, everybody can be great because anybody can serve. I believe that too. I hear that you've assembled a panel of women who exemplify Dr. King's call to service. One of those panelists is a colleague, a mentor, and a good friend of mine, Stephanie Wilson. Hi, Stephanie. This panel features three trailblazing black women. It's such an impressive group, starting with NASA astronaut Stephanie Wilson, a veteran of three shuttle missions, along with Carol Hobson, a pilot from United Airlines, and Marion Johnson, who was a mathematician with Boeing during the Apollo era, which saw men get safely to and from the moon. Call all your daughters to come and listen to what these accomplished women have to say. Now, speaking of the moon, Stephanie and I were both honored to be a part of NASA's Artemis team that will soon return humanity to the moon. The crews that make these journeys are gonna need the support of a lot of people, like the women on today's panel, to turn those dreams into a reality. In fact, living and working on another world is the definition of a team sport. On this important day of tribute to Dr. King's legacy, it makes sense for us to recognize the power of teamwork. The only way to overcome our greatest challenges, both on and off the earth, is by working together my 22 years of public service has taught me this, that we must work together to do great and lasting things. And not just in spite of our differences, but strengthened by them. We need each other and our individual contributions. Back to Dr. King's quote. He also said that you don't have to have a college degree to serve. You don't have to make your subject and your verb agree to serve. You only need a heart full of grace, a soul generated by love. Let's spread love and grace as we serve together in our work both on and off the earth. I'd like to finish by congratulating AIAA 
and Nisby who are hosting this incredible program. Keep up your great work, shining a light on so many leaders who have not only risen to great heights, but have also brought us along with them. science, technology, engineering and math, or STEM education, as well as an aerospace and defense industry enthusiast. Her day job is focused on driving technological advancement as a system engineering manager with Northrop Grumman. I'm also glad she has been newly appointed as the Regional Deputy Director of Membership with the AIAA. Please welcome Ananga Daisy Fail. Thank you, Dan. I want to thank everyone for joining us today for this dynamic discussion. I really, really enjoyed that introduction from space. I hope you all did. That was a, a great surprise to, to see even up there, they're thinking about us on this day. Being passionate about aerospace and defense, I have to say I'm extremely excited to be joined by three of industry's leading women in aviation, space, exploration, and engineering. I hope everyone is inspired to promote technical innovation and industry entry and growth. Our panelists will give a brief overview of their career journey, and then I will engage in a dialogue. And I invite everyone here to put questions in the chat so that we can go over those. First off, I, you heard a mini introduction by astronaut Victor Glover, but we're gonna move on to uh, I would like to introduce you to Carol Hobson, a first officer at United Airlines and author of a forthcoming historical fiction about Betsy Coleman. Carol, can you tell us a bit about your career journey? Thank you, Ananga. Thank you so much. I must tell you all, um, I'm glad that we had a moment. I was incredibly, and I still am, moved by Victor Glover taking a moment from outer space to talk about how important it is for women to be in aerospace. I am completely moved. My name on the lips of someone who is in outer space. I am moved and I thank you for that. Thank you for that surprise and thank you for that introduction. My name is Carol Hobson. I proudly wear the uniform of a United Airlines pilot but I've wanted this uniform since I was a little girl and I never knew anyone who was black, who was a woman and who flew airplanes. When I was 34 years old, I decided that I was gonna stop wishing and start doing. And I wound up quitting my job. I was a, a vice president for a fortune uh, 500 and a 100 company and a girlfriend of mine who became my mentor, my friend, Captain Jenny Beatty, introduced me to Bessie Coleman. In the picture that you see right there, she's standing there looking fierce. And I will tell you that one of the saddest things in my life was that I've been to college, an Ivy League graduate school, and I didn't know that Bessie Coleman existed. When I found out who she was, my goal then became to stop thinking and stop wishing and start doing. A good friend of mine says that you put rocks in one hand and you wish in the other and you see which one fills up first. Sometimes she says it a different way, but you get the point. When I learned who Bessie Coleman was, I knew that there were others who didn't know who she was. So if you go to the next slide, what I decided to do was to write a historical fiction about her. Now, I'm struggling with the title, and here's the reason. This woman is peripatetic. And when my editor said it to me, I had to turn off the keyboard on my phone. I could look up the word. <laughs> and the word means many places, a follower of Aristotle. You, 
you just keep going and learning and, and learning and going in different places. And that's who she was, a black woman who barnstormed this country, the equivalent of being outer space in the 1920s. She was a phenom. And those who follow in her footsteps have her to look up to. There's one more slide I'd like to share with you. This is probably one that you haven't seen. This is from the Los Angeles Times, January 28, 1923. The only one in the world, she was. Just as each of you is the only one in the world. I'd like to finish up my remarks because two minutes, I could go on for a much longer time, but I'll focus on this. I started out as a police reporter and then from there, I moved to the National Football League. And from there, it's a Foot Locker Stores. I became the vice president, director of training and development. 145,000 associates, 4,500 stores. It was a wonderful job. But I was always sitting in the back of the airplane. The only one in the world. It's one of the titles I've been considering for this book. And my goal with the book is the following. Book movie because it is all cinematography and I'd like to see I'd like to enroll 100 black women in flight school the organization the black aerospace professionals is a remarkable organization and they have helped me get to where I am and we started a flight school in Olive Branch Mississippi and it is a remarkable school there's a whole group of black women, sisters of the skies, and they'll help as part of OBAP, as part of OBAP, they will help to get some of the young women through. In the meantime, I'm sure we'll have more questions, but I thank you for this time. I thank you for the opportunity. I'm thrilled to hear from our other panelists, and this is a mar remarkable day. Thank you. And thank you most of all as well to AIAA. Thanks. Thank you, Carol. I'm very interested to read your book and learn more about your, your vision for getting girls to be pilots. That's very, very exciting. Next, we're gonna move on to Mrs. Marion Lee Johnson, a mathematician, educator, and retired Boeing engineer who was critical to the Apollo Saturn V rocket and helping Neil Armstrong land on the moon. Mrs. Johnson, can you tell us a bit more about your career journey? You're on mute, sorry. Oh, Thank there you, you go, we have you now. Oh, okay, very good. Uh, it's just such an amazing day. Uh, it's about to move me to tears already and we're not through half of the program. Uh, but first, I would like to thank the AIAA and NASB, this group for having this amazing panel discussion. Right now I'm just moved and words are really being limited right now. Uh, I feel honored to be a part of the panel, to be with uh, Carol and Stephanie two amazing young women. They are truly an inspiration to all young people in aviation and aerospace now and in the years to come. My name is Marion Lee Johnson and they call me a hidden figure. My bio is included in the program information for your review. And when Mr. Glover's uh, video took off, geez, I thought that was mine. Uh, but it was so good to see him and hear him express what it means to him on this Martin Luther King Day. But let me talk a little bit about things that are not on my bio. Much like Katherine Johnson, Dorothy Vaughn, and uh, Mary Jackson, who were in the 2017 movie, Hidden Figures. I was in the background. 
it was decades before I even knew something like this was going on. These women were my predecessors who served in as the brains. Let me just say that again. They served as the brains behind one of the greatest operations in history at that time. And that was the launch of John Glenn into orbit around the earth on February 20th, 1962. A stunning achievement that restored the nation's confidence, turned around the space race and galvanized the world. Of course, five years later, I began my career as an associate engineer at the Boeing Company in Huntsville, Alabama. Boeing was a leader in building the largest rocket ever built, the Apollo Saturn V. I was assigned to the launch systems uh, branch at Boeing and worked on the NASA project with the legendary Warner Von Braun's and Arthur Rudolph. They were the brains behind everything. My team members were professional and they treated me with respect. And of course, as you saw in the Hidden Figures movie, uh, running to the ladies room outside of the building, I didn't have to go through any of that. Oh, how amazing, how truly grateful I was of that. I was responsible for preparing data inputs for simulation of vehicle piece impact trajectories. I was honored to receive significant commendations in March of 1969 for a perfect score of 20 successful mission runs in 20 attempts. Bowen also recognized me for my displaying of dedication, technical competence, and high standards of achievement in contributing to lunar landing mission on July 20th. We can't forget that date, July 20th. 1969, where Neil Armstrong said, that's one small step for man and one giant leap for mankind. I was humbled to have my name enshrined in the Apollo Saturn V Roll of Honor. A copy of that historic role is in the Library of Congress and the Smithsonian Institution in both in Washington, D.C. Let me tell you a little bit about my childhood. My childhood was anchored in that old family tradition where values mattered. And they're still relevant today to motivate, mentor, and improve our young people. I grew up with humble beginnings in Savannah, Georgia. My mother worked as a nurse. My dad was a cement finisher. We had a little money, not a whole lot, but we were comfortable but they instilled in us a rigid work ethic, deemed education critically important to our household. My seventh grade math teacher, Mr. Walter B. Simmons, he motivated me and inspired me to love mathematics. And he became my mentor. I worked hard to achieve what I did. I achieved valedictorian of driven with my studies 
I was blessed with a partial scholarship and I attended college and my family paid for the rest. Following my two year mission with Boeing, NASA, I was employed at Pfizer Inc and retired a project leader after 26 years of service. I later worked at the Brantford Hall Career Institute, formerly known as the Chubb Institute, as a computer networking and security instructor, where I received the award of excellence for dedicated service and outstanding accomplishments. After retiring from Brantford Hall, I've been giving lectures and speaking engagements at various schools, colleges, and universities around the country to motivate and inspire young people to pursue a career in STEM. Thank you. And I know I've spoken a while, uh, but now we, need, we it needed it. To you. We needed it, Mrs. Johnson. <laughs> Your story is amazing. <laughs> and I have so many more questions that I want to learn each part of those. <laughs> Lastly, we have astronaut Stephanie Wilson, who is also an aerospace engineer. I already mentioned a NASA astronaut, a veteran of three space flights. Stephanie, can you tell us a little bit more about your journey? Yes, well, thank you. And I would also like to add my thanks to AIAA and to NSBE. And I would also like to say how honored I am to be uh, among these uh, esteemed panelists. Uh, I'm very excited to uh, participate in the panel today and to hear uh, everyone's story. And my story began uh, in Massachusetts where I grew up. I was born in Boston. I grew up in a small town in Western Mass and was uh, very um, inspired by the night sky. In eighth grade, as part of a career assignment class, I was asked to interview someone who worked in an interesting career field. And at the time I was interested in astronomy. I interviewed a local area college professor and uh, was fascinated by his work. He had an opportunity to do research, to work with students, to uh, travel for different astronomical events. And I thought that that would be a wonderful way to contribute um, as a STEM professional. Also though, I had an interest in devices and understanding how components work. And uh, I eventually decided to study uh, engineering in college, went on to study uh, engineering science at Harvard University, and then took my first job at Martin Marietta, uh, the former Martin Marietta and worked uh, in the loads and dynamics group on the Titan IV launch vehicle. That was very exciting work. I had an opportunity to work as a member of team, as a team with other uh, structural dynamicists. And then I uh, made my way to graduate school at the University of Texas, studying aerospace engineering there, the control of large flexible spacecraft, and then went to work on, uh, at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, the uh, uh, NASA Center there in California on the Galileo spacecraft. And from there, that is when I applied to become a member of the astronaut office. I applied two times, and so perhaps my uh, theme for today might be perseverance. I applied uh, the first time and received a rejection letter from NASA saying, uh, thank you very much for your application. We have many wonderful and fine applicants for this year. Uh, please consider resubmitting your application uh, in a future year, which I did. And the next time that, uh, asked that NASA uh, had a call for astronauts, I put in my application and was very excited to receive an interview, uh, a, a request to uh, interview at the Johnson Space Center. And uh, from there, I joined the astronaut class of 1996, working here at the Johnson Space Center. Um, my uh, Three space flights aboard Space Shuttle Discovery were all uh, assembly missions to uh, assemble the International Space Station, the uh, wonderful orbiting laboratory that we have uh, where we're doing uh, research. And you saw the clip from my colleague, Victor Glover, who is there now. He's a member of a seven person crew that's living there 
24 hours a day. They're completing their six-day expedition, conducting research in biology and human physiology uh, and, and technology transfer, tech demonstration, um, and physical earth and uh, physical and earth and space science. So it's a wonderful um, opportunity to work at NASA and to uh, participate in STEM and uh, to, shall we say, have an out of, out of the world experience. So thank you very much for this time to uh, make some opening remarks and I look forward to the rest of the panel. Thank you, Stephanie. You know, each of you, as you were giving your story, I started to think of, you know, there's so many other things I wanna learn. And so I think that everybody on the call today would really enjoy learning a little bit more about how you got to where you got. So I would like to explore how you came into your role leveraging sponsorship and mentorship. What were some of those critical experiences that helped propel you forward? And Carol, could we start off with you? Sure, that doggone mute button, you always gotta find it. I'd love to start. Um, I am absolutely positively thrilled to have listened to both ladies on this panel. Um, they're pretty spectacular. I would say when you start talking about sponsorship and mentorship, there are some amazing things that happen when we partner and when we listen and when we tune in to what people share with us. So when I think about sponsorship, I think about all of the remarkable opportunities that I've had through the organization of Black Aerospace Professionals. And I will say, I will sing their praises just as you would for Nesby. It has been my fraternity. It has been my sorority. What do I mean by that? So I quit my six figure a year job and I went to flight school full time. And I love this one sentence. And I went from making six figures a year to $17 an hour and I've never been happier. Really? Yes, really. I was moving and grooving and everything was just falling into place. And then September 11th happened. Life is like that. This pandemic, that assault on the Capitol, George Floyd being murdered before our eyes. Things that are seminal things change things for us forever. And so for me, September 11th changed things forever. And what that meant was I had gotten married. We moved to, from Manhattan to New Jersey so that I could fly. And then there was no flying. There's no hiring. There was vapor, kind of nothing. And it causes you to retreat. And it's when things happen, right, when these seminal events happen, that, you're, that you show your mettle, that your strength, that your fortitude, that you never ever give up that that happens. And so for me, I had children and my husband said to me, this is an opportunity not to be missed. Take this time in life, take this snapshot and reflect on it and now's the time to have children. And the sponsorship, the mentorship that went to sponsorship, how that changed in my life was that I blinked and 14 years went by. And as that happened, my mentors in OBAP grew to be my sponsors almost in life. And so one of my mentors, Captain Albert Glenn, said to me, come down to Memphis you keep talking about all these black women and getting them into flight school. Stop talking and get down here. Okay. He picked me up at the terminal. He said, hold out your hand. That's one of my favorite stories. And I held up my hand. I did what he said. Because sometimes there's something to obedience. And as I held out my hand, he put in my hand three keys. One to his home. One to his pickup truck. And one to his airplane. <laughs> What? The amount of trust that someone would put into my hand. And then he said this to me. I want you to go fly some of those young women whom you have been mentoring. Go out there and fly with them. I leave for India 
in the morning. So that's like, you know, that's when you get the, the new piece of tech. And well, I guess I shouldn't hold up my old tech, but I'll hold it this way. You get the new piece of tech and there's no writing to follow. You got to go online to get your information about the tech. You've been cut, you know, go do it. And he said to me, not only do I want you to fly with them, but I want you to take notes. I want you to learn. And then I want you to give it back to us. When I go to India, I'll be gone for 17 days. Go fly. Now, I will say he checked on us every day. <laughs> he did check every day. But that experience, that to me was where a sponsorship, excuse me, where mentorship evolved into sponsorship. And what I was to do with that was on me. And then I was able to take that trust and that experience. And, and I like to use the term pixie dust, pixie dust to the young women whom I was mentoring. Now, here goes the next phase. It takes more than pixie dust to get 100 black women enrolled in flight school. We can do it. We've sent people to the moon. We've sent them to outer space. We talked to Victor Glover from space today. We can do this. We need that community that I talked about. We need never give up. And we have that. And that's the service component of sponsorship. Sponsorship is, I don't let you go. There's another mentor of mine a woman named Vanessa Blocknell Jameson. She's my friend, she's my sister, she's my mentor. And we served together in Hobart. First female leadership team, phenomenal, fun. Um, I think that the lesson of never, ever, ever give up applies. And so I spent 14 years at home raising my kids. And then after that, stop adding them years up, y'all. After that, I went <laughs> to get my job as an airline pilot. And then from there, like a pull up, like a chin up to United Airlines. And I don't want to be alone. We have approximately at United Airlines, I believe we're 19 black women. It's not enough. It's not enough. It's not enough in the industry. It's not enough. And United has the most, and it, it's a wonderful, wonderful organization. But we, as a people, we will do better. And it comes with service. It comes with work. Thanks for listening. I'm sure you'll have other questions. But while I have the moment, one of the things Victor said, and I wrote it down, is that he has a heart full of grace. What? Somebody in outer space has a heart full of grace. That's stunning to me. And I think it's grace that goes before each of us. And I'd like to use that as we go forward and we find one of the black women to interest in staff. Thank you, Carol. You, you bring up a lot of thoughts along the lines of, you know, I never heard it that way, transferring your sponsorship, your the transfer between your sponsorship and mentorship. And really, and I like how you said, what you do with it is what comes next and what matters. Before we move on to the, the next question, I, I wanted to hear from one more person in terms of mentorship and sponsorship uh, in your career. And, um, Stephanie, would you mind commenting on that? Oh, not at all. Thank you. And um, I would say that I have um, had the wonderful opportunity to uh, benefit from having many mentors um, throughout uh, my career. When I was at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, I participated in a, a new employee mentoring program. Charlie Bell was my mentor there. Uh, once I came here to Johnson Space Center, I've had many mentors uh, in the astronaut office. And um, it is important, I found, to have mentors uh, both um, inside one's home organization and then also outside. And it brings the perspective of um, 
being able to um, navigate and understand the uh, home organization and the working of that internal organization and then how it relates to the perspective of the uh, of the larger company. And so for the work that we do here at Johnson Space Center, very uh, integrated among the programs and projects, it's important to have both the perspective of, of uh, my office and then how it relates to the other programs and projects and other organizations at the Johnson Space Center. So that has been a very helpful uh, to me uh, uh, over the years. And for sponsorship, I would say that in, early in my career, I was not aware of that as much. It was happening, but I was not necessarily aware that it was happening. And now as a branch chief, I have the opportunity to serve as a sponsor. I have the opportunity to advocate for people when they are not present or not um, uh, part of the conversation. And I find that to be uh, very rewarding, having the opportunity to advocate for someone, uh, ensuring that they are able to uh, gather the skills that they need to move on to their the next level in their career. Um, it's, it's very important. Both mentorship and sponsorship go hand in hand and are very important and uh, have been important for me uh, as I have uh, transitioned throughout my career. And then it's also important um, to be able to do that for others. And I have enjoyed uh, that opportunity. So thank you for the chance to answer the question. Thank you, Stephanie. You really highlighted the importance of diversity and when you're trying to find your mentorship opportunities and sponsorship opportunities, um, you know, just having those diverse perspectives. One of the things I want us to do is pivot a little bit. So Mrs. Johnson, you gave us a very excellent detail of your career, and I want to tap into that a little bit more. So one of the things I wanted to think about is as we, uh, as we build upon our experiences in driving our careers, for you particular, what was the turning point or the aha moment when you realized that you were a trailblazer? How about 50 years, uh -huh. later? years later? That was my <laughs> aha moment. I saw the previews of Hidden Figures on TV. And I thought, are they talking about me? And I just couldn't believe it that they were portraying stuff on the big screen about the moon landing. I was at, I was just amazed. That was my aha uh, uh, moment. And uh, finally, I got calls from my family, from my girls and said, Ma, don't we remember something about you? working for NASA? And I say, yes. Uh, early on, I tried to tell you guys about it, but I guess there was no interest at that time. And of course, uh, my oldest daughter said, Ma, we, 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 I need, we need to talk to you. Can we put something on Facebook? And at that time, technology, that type of technology was just not for me. And uh, I told her no. And she was kind of sad, but my youngest daughter followed it up. And she said, Ma, I'm coming home and I need for you to pull out everything, all your pictures and your everything so I can see what's going on. And when she came in, she made a special trip home just to do that. And we pulled out all of the papers, I had everything in plastic covers that I had kept in my hutch over the years and my special coins. And she said, mom, why is this not on the walls? And I'm saying, well, you know, at that time, um, you know, I had a job to do and that's what I did. And that's what I was focused on. But she said, you, we got to put this out on Facebook. Can we do it? And of course, I had to tell her no, since I had said no to my older daughter. And of course, my husband is always in the background. He knew what was going on. And uh, she said, may I talk to dad? And I said, yeah, you can talk to your dad. And of course, she twisted him around her little finger 
And of course, he allowed some things to be put on Facebook. And after that, things just grew and grew and grew. I had my first speech at one of the churches. And after that ceremony, it was so, it was so, to me, it was so great. I was being recognized. I was being honored for the work that I had done. Jeez, I felt just like Cookie in the movie. 2017, Hidden Figures. I mean, it was, that was an aha moment. And I could continue with this and take it to our young people, take it to our young women who wanted to succeed in this area and who I wanted to succeed. Just to hear Carol and Stephanie is just, it just bringing tears to my eyes. They had the sponsorships at that time. I did not. I started out, you know, I guess flying by the seat of my pants, but I had a mentor from the seventh grade and he kept me going. He inspired me and he said, you know, they're going to need to have women in the field and you are there, go get them. And that allowed me to pursue college and fortunately obtain a job at the Boeing company. Can I, can I jump in there right now? Yeah. I, I can't let that go. First yes. of all, I mean, I wrote down so many things you said and your aha moment came years later. So I wrote years. down her perspective. <laughs> perspective right so so one of the lessons i'm learning from you is that doers do mm. do, do they don't yes. look around and wait for other people to send them an invitation they don't wait for you know the spotlight in fact you yes. run from it I, I would rather no spotlight you know the social media thing i i, I i'm not crazy about it but yet i do love the fact that you can connect to people so June 15th, 1921, Bessie received, Bessie Coleman received her certificate in France and embedded in that sentence is the sentence that she led to learn how to speak French. And that is remarkable. We are coming up to the centennial. I want my book published then. Yes. Because I want that story told then. That beautiful hutch behind you. There's story in there. Let them put it on Facebook, honey. I mean, <laughs> let them put it on their eyes. Because you, you living, beautiful legend, you. We need to learn. We need to, that's perspective. For me, perspective was hearing Victor Glover say my name. Like, he knows who I am. <laughs> you know, talking to you, talking to Stephanie. Talking to Nanga, what? Talking to women, women. about this field, the, the, the celebration that we're on an AIAA stage with yes. movies leading the charge on this conversation about STEM and women and how I didn't take my first flight lesson until I was 36 years old. Uh -huh. I joined an airline at 50. So that's everything, right? That's women. That's the ages. Ages. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. And then that mentorship goes to sponsorship. And that sponsorship is really amplified with champions. So at United Airlines, when I joined and started flying the 737, one of my instructors was just extraordinary. And his name was Captain Ray Evans. And he was my, my instructor. And my, what's known as your IOE instructor, the guy who takes you from the simulator to the real operational environment. Mm -hmm. His name was Captain Cleo Ratliff. These were, these were extraordinary black men who just like literally took me under their wing. Sometimes they were gentle, sometimes not so much. Yeah. But they were my champions. So mentor, sponsor, champion, like, strength in that and that there's this wonderful song by Calvin Harris 
where he says, I'm a giant. Stand on my shoulders and tell me what you see. When we get to the selfless point that we want people on our shoulders, tell me what it is that you see in space. Stephanie Wilson, astronaut, tell me what it is that you see in Marion Johnson, what you saw. Stand on my shoulders and tell me. That's when we pull others. That's when we lift and pull. Thank you. Yeah, it's amazing. I, I want to pull on the trailblazer thread again. I know that uh, I like it when you said, uh, Mrs. Johnson, you, you didn't know you were a trailblazer until afterwards. And so, Stephanie, one of the things I was thinking about, uh, still going down this uh, trailblazer theme, how did you transition? or expand your scope in your role to be a living trailblazer, a living example? And I was, um, so I'm just, I am in awe of the um, conversation so far. It really is very moving and very uh, thought provoking and uh, very humbling. And when I came into the astronaut office as a member of the class of 1996, I was um, very fortunate to be joined by two other African-American women, Joan Higginbotham and Yvonne Cagle. And uh, very fortunate that uh, uh, we came in together and uh, joining our class in total number of 44 people. Um, and um, transitioning together through our initial training as we do as astronaut candidates, and then being able to focus though after the training on the technical work and being a member of a team. And so I found that uh, really in order to be able to, uh, you know, move along the path and to move through that moment is really to focus on the work at hand and to be sure to uh, take advantage of opportunities that are presented, gather the technical skills that are required to uh, do the work here at Johnson Space Center and be prepared for space flight was really the way to transition from um, the enormity of it all and then being able to be prepared and to be placed and to contribute, to bring value to the organization so that then, as Carol is saying, we can reach back and bring others along. We do our own part to wear the path and make the path visible for others so that others can find it and follow. And uh, it's, that, um, it's that whole process that um, that enables us to continue and go forward. What was your aha moment when you were like, I'm a trailblazer? <laughs> and it's interesting, I, I mentioned um, both Joan and Yvonne. And so for me, it, it was not necessarily, uh, was not necessarily the case that I felt that I was the trailblazer, but uh, with the three of us together coming into the class, I felt that we were, um, the next group, of course, after Dr. Uh, Mae Jemison to um, come into the astronaut program and to um, be representatives. So I felt that uh, I shared that uh, trailblazing uh, experience together uh, with my colleagues. Awesome. There's a, there's a lot of uh, good meat here. Uh, and so one of the things that uh, was mentioned in each of your bios is how your career changed a little bit. And so Kara, briefly, can you tell us about your career, your career transitions? You mentioned it, but what was that one thing that drove that transition in your career? And we have a lot of questions in the chat also about people who are inspired to be pilots, but they find it a little daunting because of the cost. And what recommendations do you have? So, so I'll take the first part first, unpack that. I think, I think a curiosity, a healthy curiosity, a pursuit of your curiosity is key um, to not only staving off Alzheimer's, but, right, because every time you engage and you do something different, your mind, it's like exercise for your mind. Every time you do that, and I don't say that lightly, I mean it. Every time you do something and you challenge your brain, 
to accept something that's in your little spirit. And you go after that and you pursue it and you don't blink. You pursue it, you run after it as if your whole life depends on it. When you do that, there's a focus. There's a focus that is so laser that everything else around you, right? The noise, it's just that, it's noise. Your, your focus is on that target. And when you get that laser-like focus, it becomes almost like a guiding star. And there's I, I, almost anything can happen and things happen. Relationships happen, children happen, family, um, money issues, school. Let's get right to that. All of those things, they are real factors. I would make light of none of them. And all of those are important. But just as in any emergency, we prioritize. And what's most important, that goal. If you say, this is something that I want to do, I started at the very bottom of my career and I saved a lot. Now, if you find yourself in the circumstance, oh my goodness, I've got college debt. I really want to do this, but I've got this, I've got that, I've got the other. I would submit to you that today, today, and I love how Stephanie talked about, it wasn't just she, but there were three. When you feel most alone, so many people, and that's why I said I don't criticize social media all the time, jump on social media, not just a Kickstarter, but find scholarships. Many of us go out there and beg and borrow and get scholarships. And some of them go without applicants. That's an outrage. Hop online, ask Google any question and pull up every scholarship, apply for them. Try your best to parlay one into the other. Organization of Black Aerospace Professionals gives scholarships. Women in Aviation, they give scholarship. Um, AOPA gives scholarships. I don't know about AIAA or NSBE, but I bet you one thing, if I needed it, I'd be looking. Make sure you tap your mentors. When I first started talking to Captain Glenn about this, he said, come down, let's figure it out. There are people who will help you problem solve. But if you want it, if you're laser focused, there are more resources today than ever before. Hop online, do your research. And then when you do that, when you're looking for a mentor, your mentor will find you. Confucius, you know, when the pupil is ready, the when the pupil is ready, the teacher appears. And that's true because you surround yourself by what it is that you want to become. You have no choice but to become that. Awesome. And find those scholarships. you find them. So talking about, you know, we know what we want to do. We're laser focused. And one of the things I want to tra transition here, because we have a, a dynamic panel of technical women, is as women, our technical strength is sometimes challenged or overlooked. Has that happened to you? And how did you navigate that? And Stephanie, I would like to start with you on this. Certainly, and that's um, that is a tricky question, and um, you know can be a deterrent. And Victor actually uh, mentioned this a bit in his video. He talked about teamwork or the larger NASA team, and I um, am also a big fan of teamwork and. Um, it is very helpful, and in particular in this case, when um, perhaps uh, an individual might be doubting someone else's skills or technical capability, that's an opportunity to leverage the strength of the team. So um, I commented earlier about um, kind of digging in and being able to be prepared technically and taking advantage of opportunities to prepare uh, expertise and technical skill. And that uh, brings value to the team. And when the team is strong and recognizes that contribution and respects it, then when uh, difficulties arise about doubting technical expertise or capability, the team really can, can fortify that. And if things are 
directed perhaps not at the team member who has the technical expertise. Team members can redirect um, and that can be a framework within which people can um, work to better uh, reinforce their technical skill. Um, so I have found that teams and leveraging teams in that way has been a way to um, reinforce the representation of an organization of which I'm a member or reinforce the technical expertise that I'm, I'm bringing to that particular discussion or, um, or resolution or technical uh, problem that we're solving. Okay. Uh, Mrs. Johnson, do you wanna comment on that shortly? Oh, yes. Uh, short, can't be short. <laughs> uh, I have to thank Bowen for giving me the opportunity to work with the team to hone my team building skills. And when the um, Apollo 5 started to run out of funds. And I wasn't quite ready for that yet because I was still sending money home to my parents. And I have to, I had to find another way. So I transitioned to computer science. I worked with Pfizer Inc. in New York. And the thing that I had to overcome is I had to learn a new programming language. No more Fortran. I said, wow. So the new programming language was COBOL. And COBOL was a language, I mean, that I could understand. You know, it was just like English. I can work with this. So I went into a job training program. And I came out on top. And I was thrilled. I worked my way through. I never let anything stop me. I was eager and hungry to be out there. I wanted to make do. I wanted to make a mark. And I did. But you know, as you go along and you obtain certain ranks, I became a project leader a woman of color at that time. And I started having a little trouble. And one of my employees, I had about nine employees working for me at that time, male and female. And one of my male employees thought that maybe he could get further ahead. And I'm saying to myself, is it because I'm a woman? Is it because I'm a black woman? What is going on? And I never saw that until the end of that year when I received my review. My review was so low, I, I mean, I was almost in tears. That was the first I've always hit the ceiling. And I'm looking at my, uh, immediate boss at that time. And I looked at him and I said, I'm not signing this. And he said, well, you know, you have to. No, I don't. I don't have to sign this. But I will take this with me and I will write you a rebuttal. I was sad when I left the office. I went back to my office. And of course, information was on the review that I could use. And I assembled all of my documentation. And you have to remember, documentation is key to whatever you do. I assembled all of my documentation on this individual. I went home. I had a pad with me. And on the train, my fingers were just running across the page. I was getting angry. I wasn't sad any longer. I was angry. I was writing my rebuttal. I came home. My husband took one look at me and he knew something was something was definitely off. And we wrote, we put together this rebuttal and 
I decided I was going to take the day off. But guess what? I received a call the next day from his boss. And he said, I understand, Ms. Johnson, that uh, you um, are not satisfied with your review. And I told him I was not. I was taking the day so I could write a rebuttal. And he said, why don't you bring it in? And I have a secretary at your disposal. So that she could key this in, I attachments to it. And as the secretary typed, she was in awe. She couldn't believe what she was reading because the review didn't make any sense. It had no substance. And so my immediate boss's boss, who was the department lead, said, let's, we'll have a meeting. So as the rebuttal was completed, I took it to my boss. I said, our boss wants to see us. Let's have a meeting. And the look on his face told me everything I needed to see. So we had a meeting with his boss. And as all of the material, the evidence flow as to what my job was and what I was doing, his boss looked at him and said, is this true? He couldn't believe it. He said, the meeting is over, Ms. Johnson. You go back to your office and I will touch base with you later. The next thing I knew, the young man who was in question, he came to my office and he said to me, you have people in high places. And I said, no, I know my job. The same way I tried to train you, you mishandled. You tried to deal with it on your own. You know, a little of that old backstabbing stuff. And at that moment, he was let go. And I take the bull by the horns. You have to make your mark. You have to let understand your job is very important. And documentation is the key. Never forget to document. Oh my goodness. Thank you, Mrs. Johnson. The, that, you know, documentation is important and understand your job. We, we've come to the end of a very dynamic conversation. And I thank all of you here for sharing your story and um, Dr. Jo Dexter Johnson will be joining us here shortly to give some closing remarks on the program. And what I just wanted to let everybody, uh, we got your, your advice, Mrs. Johnson, but Carol and also Stephanie, if there was one word you wanted everybody to walk away with as a final statement of what you need to do um, as we're navigating this industry, and then we'll turn it over to Dr. Johnson. Like me to go first? Sure. Be hungry. Be hungry. Be hungry. Be hungry. Stephanie? And I would say it's more than one word passionate pursuit with perseverance. Oh. Passionate pursuit with perseverance. Be hungry. Know your job and document. With that, I think I, want, I, want, I, th I truly thank you ladies for this wonderful discussion and myself, I've been uh, personally touched and really I'm amazed by your story so much to learn. And so what I'm gonna do right now is hand it over to Dr. Johnson, who is Loads and Dynamics Technical Fellow at NASA and also our Partnerships Director within the Nesby Aerospace SIG. And he also has technical roles within AIAA. Dexter? Thank you, Ananga. Good afternoon, everyone. Good wow, afternoon. what an outstanding <laughs> panel discussion. 
Good afternoon. <laughs> I am Good so afternoon. proud of my trailblazer friends. <laughs> They are truly amazing people who are women soaring upward and onward. Awesome job. I am so proud of you guys. I am Dr. Dexter Johnson, and I'm proud to be a long-standing member and leader within AIAA and NSBE. I hope you enjoyed today's program. I truly enjoyed our tribute to service. What a great success. You know, Dr. King said that not everybody can be famous, but everybody can be great. Why? Because greatness is determined by service. You only need a heart full of grace and a soul generated by love. It's funny, Victor actually shared that. And that was one of the quotes by Dr. King that really had stood out to me. And so we're obviously in sync with Dr. King's statement. So this event was a product of passionate collaboration and unity of purpose focused on service between AIAA, the NSBE Aerospace Special Interest Group, and other key contributors and supporters. Uh, we need to see our world, country, and community unite to serve one another peacefully. I now want to extend a heartfelt thanks to our organization, sponsor, attendees, contributors, supporters, speakers, panelists, moderators, and the planning team. So thank you to AIAA and Dan Dumbacher, the executive director, to NSBE Aerospace Special Interest Group, Benanga Fale, executive director, Legacy Bridges STEM Academy Incorporated, Dr. Joy Spragan, CEO, to the Organization of Black Aerospace Professionals for enabling Carol Hobson to be a part of today's uh, session, and to Tennessee Garvey, my point of contact there, uh, to the NASA Astronaut Appearance Office uh, for allowing Stephanie Wilson to participate, uh, Babette Klingen, also to University of Texas at Dallas and Dr. Jackie Long, uh, and Dr. Stephanie G. Adams Dean. And to Ben's Chili Bowl, thank you, Virginia Ali, who's co founder with her late husband, Ben. What a wonderful session to open up our session today. And then, of course, our uh, documented original Tuskegee Airmen, a part of the Tuskegee Airmen Incorporated. Thank you, Dr. Joy, for having them participate in today's program. And we're grateful for our sponsor of today's event, Lockheed Martin. And so to our guest speakers and panelists, Major General Charles F. Bolden Jr., uh, General Lester Lyles, our Red Tail, uh, George Hardy, Lieutenant Colonel in the United States Air Force, retired, and our family member, the son of a dis dis documented original Tuskegee Airmen, Richard Ball, thank you. Uh, we had such a wonderful uh, singing of uh, God Bless America by Jillian Peertel. Thank you so much. And certainly to cap it off with a wonderful panel of women trailblazers, Carol Hobson, author of First Offers with United Airlines, Marion Johnson, hidden figure and Boeing engineer, and Stephanie Wilson, who's a part of the Artemis astronaut team, could possibly be the first woman to actually step foot on the moon. And so lastly, I want to just thank the AIAA and NSBE Aerospace Special Interest Group MLK event planning team, Alexi Broxson, Samantha McGill, Dr. Jackie Long, Landani Johnson, Ananga Fale, Dr. Joyce Bragans, myself and many, many others. I just want to say thank you, thank you, and thank you. So as we bring this program to a close, our opportunity to serve remain open. I invite you to connect with AIAA, NSBE, Aerospace Special Interest Group, and our collaborators. Uh, 
a personal focus of mine in order to take action is encapsulated in the following statement, roar to soar. And that stands for root out all racism to see our aspirations realized. Let's ensure we all have a chance to fly high. So seek to serve. Don't miss the opportunity today to move from inspiration to perspiration to transformation. I implore you to be great and serve. Once again, Dr. King's sentiment is that everybody can be great because anybody can serve. Opportunities to serve are provided on the event registration site. There were some that were shown on the video at the break, but feel free to visit that site to be able to see what else you can be able to do on this day of service. Thank you for attending today's MLK Tribute to Service. Have a service-filled day. Thank you.